The Lord's Prayer. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So which part of that prayer do you think Christ chooses to explain, to give a bit more detail about? There's so many profound ideas that are expressed in very simple words. Does Christ explain the character of God as a father? Or his holiness, perhaps? Or the meaning of his name and how that reflects his purpose and, and his character? And how we can be part of that in, in his kingdom? Does he expand on the nature of temptation and the, and the need to avoid that? Or does he give more details about the coming kingdom and the rulership over all the earth? None of those things. In the very next verse, verse 14, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Another verse, But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. It's so important that Christ states it both positively, if ye forgive, and negatively, if you forgive not. We don't have a choice. If we forgive, we will receive God's forgiveness. If we don't forgive, we will not be forgiven. So today we're going to be talking about forgiving each other. And it's really as important as God forgiving us because if we don't forgive, neither will, be, well, neither will he. So, of course, we're talking about fairly uh, serious offences here. We're not talking about the, the, you know, the brother who pushed in front of you in the line for breakfast this morning. Um, if we can't get over that sort of stuff, I guess that, uh, that we've, we've got more issues than, uh, than possibly we thought. We're talking about real, real offences, of course. Being slandered by another person, uh, marital infidelity perhaps, abuse of whatever kind, personal infractions, um, offences that make others perhaps leave the truth, uh, offences that wound us, perhaps, or worse, perhaps cause us to doubt uh, our faith in God or in his ecclesia. So why do we forgive? Well, we've already seen one reason there, and it's, you know, that should be enough, really. And that reason is because we're told to do so. And also the reason that, uh, of course, if we don't forgive, God won't forgive us. But there's plenty of other reasons as well. So we're going to go through some of these reasons uh, this morning. Now, we've heard the saying, to err is human, but to forgive is divine. And that's true, of course, because mercy is one of God's characteristics. And so as a part of our aim as to manifest God, manifest his son's character, we need to learn to be merciful. And part of that is learning to forgive. And as humans, forgiveness, mercy is not natural to us. Uh, we have to learn it. We don't have to learn judgment or retribution. We, we, they seem to come naturally to us, but we do need to learn forgiveness. So every time we read about God's character, we learn about this idea of him being merciful and gracious and long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity. That will by no means clear the guilty, of course, but all those merciful and forgiving words uh, start the description of his characteristics. So that's one reason. Our aim, of course, is to show agape love, isn't it? This new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. I think uh, Brother Harry Tennant was uh, the first person I heard give the definition of, of agape love as love without a cause. So God loves us not because we're particularly lovely uh, or lovable. Uh, we've done nothing worthy of receiving his love, and yet he gives it to us anyway. And this is agape love, isn't it? Love undeserved, love without a cause. And we know that we need to develop that same love in our own lives. Uh, as part of agape love, we need to develop forgiveness. And in the same way that love is causeless, uh, our forgiveness of other people is also causeless. We don't forgive people because they deserve to be forgiven, but in the spirit of agape love, we forgive without any reason. We have Christ's example. He freely uh, forgave his uh, persecutors. And we're going to look at this again a little bit later. But Peter talks about the fact that when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. 
but committed himself to God. We've already seen, of course, that it is a, a uh, condition of God forgiving us. So one of our three principles of forgiveness uh, is that uh, in order for God f to forgive us, we need to forgive others. It's not our place as sinners to condemn uh, another sinner. So uh, John chapter 8 verse 7 says, when they continued asking him, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in our last session, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Uh, and this comes with a caveat, we don't condone sin either, or, of course, but the fact that we are sinners too should at least give us pause before we condemn someone else instead of forgiving them. Our judgment of another person is likely to be flawed. Unlike God's judgment, God's judgment is perfect. Our judgment is very human and very erroneous. So if we're going to err, uh, which we inevitably are going to do, it's better to err on the side of mercy, especially when it comes to judging someone else's motives, which we can't see, and yet, of course, we are so quick to judge. So Romans 14 verse 4, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? Who, who are you to judge God's servant? It's to his own master he stands or falls. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him to stand. Think about what God has done for each of your brothers and sisters. God has forgiven them. Christ has died for them. God has chosen for them a place in his kingdom. They've been accounted righteous by God. They're God's sons and daughters. So if God is prepared to do all this for our brothers and sisters, who are we to condemn them? Romans 8, words we know pretty well, I think. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who's going to lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Is it going to be God that's busy justifying them? Who's going to condemn them? Is it Christ who died for them? Is, is that who's going to condemn them? Of course not. And we use this passage, of course, to strengthen our own faith. If God be for us, we say, who, who can be against us? But think about that in reference to your brothers and sisters as well. If God is for them, should we be against them? If God is doing everything that he can to bring this brother or sister into his kingdom, should we be working against that by ho perhaps holding a grudge against that brother or sister or by failing to forgive that brother or sister? Should we not all be doing everything in our power to work with God to bring that person into his kingdom? So think about that, I guess, with our interaction with, with each other, is that you know, we know that the brother or sister we're talking to is considered by God to be righteous, he's forgiven their sins. Well, how do I view them? Do I also view them as righteous? If I view them as someone who has been accounted righteous, uh, selected by God, then I'm much more likely to forgive them. If I see them as God's son or daughter, then I'm much more likely to forgive them. Not that we shouldn't forgive people who aren't uh, God's sons or daughters either. James chapter uh, 2 has that uh, classic uh, quote, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. So the idea of doing unto others as you would have done unto you. If we want to be forgiven by others, and from time to time we're all going to be need, needing forgiveness from others, then we need to extend that same grace to our neighbour. If forgiveness is something we want to receive from our fellow man, from our brothers and sisters, then forgiveness is something we need to be prepared to give as well. It's a natural, it's the only response really to God's or Christ's forgiving of us. So Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13 says we need to forbear with one another, we need to forgive one another if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which ye are also called in one body, and be thankful. So there's lots of reasons in there for us to forgive our brothers and sisters, but the key lesson is that like repentance, forgiving others is both a prerequisite of God's forgiveness of us and a response to it. So God's forgiveness of us provides the motivation really for us to forgive others. And if we are forgiven, so uh, we should forgive others as a direct response to this. Uh, and we know well that um, 
the parable of Christ, which we're, I don't think we're going to go into in this series of studies, but uh, that huge debt that was forgiven by God to each of us compared to that uh, very small debt that we forgive each of our brothers and sisters. There's a sort of distinct injustice if we uh, benefit so much from God's forgiveness and fail to extend that, uh, that benefit to others who need our forgiveness. And of course, the idea of uh, one body there in Colossians as well. It's impossible to have one body if we're, we're all carrying around uh, resentments or hatreds or not forgiving our brothers and sisters. So forgiveness is, is essential for ecclesial unity. More reasons. God's judgment of us will reflect our judgment of others. So and this is a similar idea to the Lord's Prayer, but not exactly the same. But with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. With what measure you meet, it should be measured to you again. So what measure of mercy are we wanting from God? Well, we want the maximum level of mercy from God, don't we? You know, please, God, turn, turn the mercy up to 11, please. And God will, but only if we do the same for others. The same judgment that we meet out, that's what we can expect from our Father. Our reflection, our relationship with God, uh, with our brothers and sisters, reflects our relationship with God. We love him because he first loved us. If, if you hate your brother uh, and yet you try and say, well, I love God but can't stand my brother or sister, then you're a liar because you, he that loves his brother who he has seen um, or doesn't love his brother that he has seen, how can he love God who he hasn't seen, says John. So if we claim to, if we claim to have a relationship with the God of mercy, then that's clearly going to be reflected in our relationship with our brothers and sisters. So if the, you know, the reason given to us in the Lord's Prayer wasn't sufficient, there's plenty of other reasons that uh, we should forgive our brothers and sisters. Now, our previous sessions have been all about uh, God forgiving us when we sin. And this session, it's all about uh, forgiving each other. But there's some important differences between God's forgiveness of us uh, and the forgiveness that we uh, hopefully extend to each other. So they're different in some ways, but the same in other ways. So they're different in the, in the uh, fact that uh, when God forgives us, divine forgiveness, uh, there is righteousness imputed to the forgiven. But when we forgive our brothers and sisters, of course, there's no moral impact on them uh, from our forgiveness. So when our brother or sister forgives us, it has no bearing on our salvation. But without God's forgiveness, of course, we can't be saved. Our brother might sin against us. He might be very sorry. He might have expressed that sorrow and repented with that sort of whole process of change that we looked at last time. He might have asked us for forgiveness and asked God for forgiveness as well. And we may forgive him uh, or we may not. But if God forgives him, he is saved. Um, if me and uh, brother Chris have a uh, violent uh, disagreement after the class and, and he punches me in that uh, dispute, um, I may forgive him or I may not. Um, it's not going to impact his salvation whether I forgive him or not, but it is going to impact mine if I don't forgive him. So my forgiveness carries no moral weight. God's forgiveness carries all the weight. Without that, we can't be constituted righteous and we, and we can't be saved. Forgiveness between brothers and sisters is a two-way thing, but of course, with God, it's only ever a one-way thing. So sometimes our brothers and sisters need to forgive us. Uh, sometimes we need to forgive our brothers and sisters. We can either be the giver or a receiver of, of mercy in that case, but it's, that's not, of course, the case with God. He forgives us. He forgives us many, many, many times but we never need to forgive him, do we? With our brothers and sisters, forgiveness is a two-way thing, uh, but forgiveness from God is always a one-way transaction. He does all the forgiving. And at some stage in your life, you're likely to be uh, both an offender and someone who is offended, an offendee, I guess, if you like. You're gonna be in need of forgiveness from another brother and sister, and at other stages in your life, you're going to need to forgive your brother or sister. You're never going to need to forgive God. He always is going to be the forgiver in our relationship with him. Our forgiveness to others have to be, has to be given unconditionally. And we're going to be talking more about that very shortly. But while God has the moral authority to put uh, conditions on his forgiveness of us, 
those three principles, faith, repentance, forgiving others, we don't. So our, con- our forgiving is uh, unconditional, as we'll see shortly. And while there's key differences between uh, human forgiveness and divine forgiveness, so those first three things are are sort of differences between the two, then the next three things are similarities. So God forgives freely, without cost to us, and so must we. God doesn't forgive us begrudgingly, and neither should we forgive others begrudgingly. God's forgiveness is immediate, and so should ours be. We'll talk a bit more about that again later. And God's forgiveness is unlimited in the sense of of, uh, quantity, and so should ours be as well. So some similarities, but some important differences between uh, divine forgiveness, God's forgiveness of us, and our forgiveness of each other. So we've seen, uh, hopefully, in the previous uh, classes that uh, God has, in essence, three uh, prerequisites, if you like, to his forgiveness. What demands can we make on our brothers and sisters before we will forgive them? And the answer is none. God has the moral authority, as we said, to put conditions on his forgiveness. We do not. Can we force the offender to make some sort of restitution before we forgive them? No, we can't. Can we make them pay some sort of compensation, perhaps, for the the hurt or the stress or the pain before we forgive them? No, we can't. Can we just make them perhaps just apologise even before we forgive them? No, we can't. So what does Christ say in uh, Matthew chapter 18, uh, verse 21 to 22? And here's this uh, classic uh, quote from, we've seen uh, Peter earlier from Brother Matt earlier in the, on that first exhortation. Here's a classic Peter quote. And then came Peter to him and said, Lord, you know, surely this is a great idea of mine. How shall I... Uh, my brother sin against me and I forgive him. Till seven times, that sounds like a lot to me, says Peter, as it would to most of us, I'm sure. Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Now, nothing in this verse from our Lord, nothing in this verse about making conditions before we forgive our brother. Nothing here about exacting an apology from them before we forgive them. Nothing even here about making sure that they won't do it again before we forgive them. To the contrary, there's the expectation that we will need to forgive them many, many times. And Peter no doubt thought he was being you know, generous with his estimate of, of seven times. But of course, Christ 70 times seven is really implying there's no limit. He's not sort of saying stop after 490 times, but keep forgiving indefinitely as God does. So imagine if God put a sort of numerical restriction on us for the forgiveness of our sins. Um, Think for a moment how many times God has had to forgive you, often for the same repeated uh, sin. Uh, I've done some maths, I'm an accountant, I can't help it. But uh, if we only committed one sin per day, uh, that's 365 sins a year. What if God had some sort of numeric limit on his forgiveness? What if God had some sort of three strikes policy? What if he had a 3,000 strikes policy? No more forgiveness after 3,000 times. If we're in the truth for 50 years and we only commit one sin a day, uh, that's 18,250 sins. 18,250 times our Father has to forgive us. That makes 490 uh, times forgiveness look pretty paltry, doesn't it, by comparison? What about Luke 17, uh, verse 3 to 4? Take heed to yourselves, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him, and if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day again turn to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Now, so Christ here doesn't say, forgive your brother seven times, but seven times in one day. That would really test our forgiveness resolve, wouldn't it? Once might be unfortunate, twice might be careless, but... You know, seven times we'd feel some justification in not forgiving someone uh, that's uh, trespassed uh, against us that many times. Now, there's a slightly different slant here, you'll notice. Christ does say to rebuke our brother. We may need to let him know that he's trespassed. Uh, He may be unaware of his fault, perhaps. But again, there's no hint of demanding any compensation for the trespass. Neither does he say here, you'll notice, that we need to wait for evidence of his repentance before we forgive him. 
uh, after seven times, you know, six times, three times even, we would probably be questioning the sincerity of his repentance and we might be, begin questioning his motives. Christ says, take your brother at his word. If he says he's repented, we accept that and we forgive him, no matter how many times. What about the justice of this? And here's a really uh, important point because we all, you know, our shackles rise up and we say, well, you know, that doesn't seem fair, that doesn't seem right, that, uh, you know, people can just sin against us and get away with it all the time. What about the justice or fairness of this? Justice is an important principle, isn't it? Well, not in this case. There isn't any justice or fairness in this. We suffer ourselves to be defrauded. Don't confuse the issue here. This is not about fairness or justice. When we think about God's forgiveness of our own sins, there's no justice there either, is there? It's about his mercy. He is giving us forgiveness freely. If it was about justice, we'd all be dead because the wages of sin is death. But forgiveness is not about justice or fairness. It's about grace. It's about undeserved favour. It's about mercy. It's about agape love, love without a cause. So Luke chapter 6 verse 32 says... If ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? So we're going beyond just brothers and sisters here. For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good unto them which do good unto you, what thank have ye? For sinners also, oh, and for sinners also do the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. That's the context here. Hoping for nothing again in the context of mercy. mercy. Be ye therefore also merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom, they'll pow, you know, pile this on, onto you. With the same measure that ye meet, with all it shall be measured to you again, that same principle that we've already seen. But notice verse 35, hoping for nothing again, not expecting some sort of compensation return, but hoping for nothing, not even expecting that my brother will forgive me in return but hoping for nothing. It's one thing to forgive without demanding recompense for our forgiveness. You might, you know, in my, our violent disagreement with Brother Chris down here, um, I might tell Brother Chris that he's forgiven, but demand some sort of restitution from you, hundred bucks say. Well, no, says Christ, there's no demanding restitution. So I could forgive him without demanding recompense, but secretly sort of expect some sort of recompense. I might not demand it, but I might still expect it. I might forgive him, but, but not mention any recompense, but secretly expect that he's going to come up with something to make it up to me. Then I might not even expect it, but secretly hope for it. So if I didn't demand uh, compensation, I might still expect it. If I didn't expect it, I might still hope for it. But we, we might be able to forgive without demanding recompense for our forgiveness, but still somewhat hoping for it. But Christ says here, don't even hope for it. Don't demand, don't expect, don't even hope for recompense. Uh, we give with uh, hoping for nothing again. And 1 Corinthians 6 has, uh, has the, the sort of idea here. He says there, I speak to your shame, is there not a wise man among you? And no, not one that would be able to judge between his brethren, but brother goeth to law in the Corinthian ecclesia, they're taking each other to court, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore, there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? And it's very hard to do this, isn't it? If we've been defrauded in any way, financially, uh, emotionally perhaps, we, we love, we give our love to someone, only to be rewarded with hatred or anger. We might have been defrauded physically or spiritually. We've lost something, of course. We want it back. We want justice. We want the person who defrauded us in whatever way to, to feel the pain that we've felt. Well, no, says Paul, we suffer it. 
Don't demand, don't expect, don't even hope for any recompense. Instead, forgive. This is not about them, it's about you. You can't worry about their attitude. You can only worry about your own attitude. Now, forgiveness really needs to become a, a habit for us, a way of life where we all have a response to pain, either physical or emotional pain. Uh, so normally, naturally, carnally, I guess, that response is anger. We lash out at whoever has caused us pain. Uh, we try and cause them pain in return in our anger. And if, uh, you know, carnally speaking, that might become a habit with us. But as spirit-minded people, we need to change that habit. The antidote to our angry response is a forgiving response. We don't lash out. Instead, we forgive. But we have to make forgiveness an attitude. We need to become a forgiving people. We need to nurture a culture of forgiveness. And forgiveness should be reflected in our general attitude towards life. We should be a generally forgiving people, uh, tolerant of other people's failings, not in a sort of anything goes, you know, morally or doctrinally sense, but in a gentle, long-suffering sense. Um, as a body, I, I suspect Australia, uh, Australian Christadelphians in particular, I can't sort of speak for Americans, but uh, we're a pretty critical, harsh, unforgiving bunch, to be honest. If the organist plays slowly, we criticise. The organist plays too fast, we criticise. The speaker goes over time or wanders off topic, we feel free to criticise them. The chairman prays too long or, or leaves something out that we think he should have prayed for, then we criticise. The Sunday school or youth group sort of uh, organises a an outing that we think doesn't suit our child, then, then we criticise it. We sort of feel it's our right to criticise anyone fulfilling any role. But instead we should recognise that most are doing, of course, their best in fairly thankless roles and there's no need uh, to increase the pressure on them. Instead we need to have a forgiving attitude in all aspects of life, not just forgiving offences, uh, direct offences against us. Now we've been given many reasons to uh, why we should forgive other people, why we should forgive our brothers and sisters particularly. Why do we find it so hard to do at times? We've been hurt uh, and we, we need uh, but find it very difficult to get past that hurt. Now hurt makes us want to hurt others as we've seen, not forgive them. And like a child, sometimes we don't mind hurting ourselves even if we think it's going to hurt others. You know, the old childish, I'll be sorry when I'm dead sort of attitude. So that might hurt us ultimately, but we do it because we want, to, we want to hurt them. We can't get over that hurt that we're feeling. And of course, it's not easy to get over that hurt when we've been deeply aggrieved, especially if we've been deeply aggrieved by someone who's very close to us. It's, uh, it's uh, understandable, of course, uh, even if it's not right, that we should be uh, loath to forgive someone who has caused us pain. And what's the solution here? Well, time is probably going to ease the hurt. Uh, might not eradicate it, but it might ease it. Um, and while this is the case, we don't really have the time, the luxury of waiting until our pain is eased before we can forgive the offender, of course. We need to forgive them uh, as soon as we can. If we don't forgive, then our Father's not going to forgive us. So. We don't want to impinge on our relationship with the Father, so we need to forgive quickly. So time might be one solution. Why else do we uh, find forgiveness difficult? Often uh, the faults that we see in ourselves are the things that we find hardest to forgive in other people. And this is sort of ironic, I guess, but I think it uh, generally holds true. We're least likely to forgive someone who has a fault that we recognise in ourselves. Why is that? I mean, logically, we should be sympathetic to that person if they're suffering from the same issue that we are. But often the opposite is the case. What's the solution to that? I think empathy is the solution to that. We need to empathise with that person um, and because we can. We suffer from the same thing, perhaps. We need to realise that God has forgiven us for that sin and our brethren and sisters might have forgiven us for that fault. We need to forgive it in other people as well. Why else was forgiveness difficult? Well, sometimes, sadly, uh, we like to have power over people. And this is a particularly nasty character fault, isn't it? Most of us realise, either consciously or subconsciously, that there is great power in withholding. Withholding affection, withholding money, withholding love, withholding information, withholding authority. 
and withholding forgiveness is no less powerful. We might enjoy that power that we get from withholding forgiveness and so we don't extend it as easily as we know that we should. What's the solution to that? Well, that's fairly simple. We need to recognise that that is a problem in our character and take steps to get over it uh, pretty immediately. Forgiveness makes us vulnerable. And in a literal sense, of course, this is true. And this also makes forgiveness very difficult. If we forgive someone who has trespassed against us, we become vulnerable to them taking advantage of us and repeating that offence, knowing, of course, that we're just going to forgive them again without demanding any compensation. And this applies, of course, in an emotional sense as well. If someone hurts us emotionally uh, and we freely forgive them, we run the risk of letting them wound us again. So forgiveness makes us vulnerable. Now, this might seem like a bad thing, but it isn't. Vulnerable is exactly how God wants us. Vulnerable is how he can work with us. If we put up all our defences, people have no chance of hurting us, but God also has no chance of working with us. He wants us open, vulnerable, completely reliant on him and not ourselves. Not easy to do uh, and something we resist pretty strongly, I think, but something that must be done. Sometimes we become willing prisoners of our own feelings. Uh, and uh, Colin Attridge in, in his book, The Fruit of the Spirit, uh, has this quote, forgive is to set a prisoner free and then to discover that the prisoner was you. So Acts chapter 20 verse 35 uh, has a similar idea in different words. It's more blessed to give than to receive. So it's more blessed to give uh, forgiveness than receive forgiveness. We receive more freedom from forgiving other people than we give. What's the alternative to forgiving? The alternative is to bottle up our hurt, bottle up our anger, build up resentment towards uh, specific others or the world in general, perhaps. And that's only going to result in anger, malice, disunity, uh, judgment, hasty, ill-chosen words, all the things that God's word exhorts us to avoid. Forgiveness allows us to move on. It sets us free uh, from the prison of our, our judgment or our unforgiving nature. God's forgiveness allows us to move on after we've sinned and forgiving others also releases us from our own emotional pain, from negativity, from hatred, uh, from all those feelings that can imprison us and do lasting emotional and spiritual damage. And sometimes we're sadly willing prisoners of such feelings. We want to feel hurt. We want to feel pain. We want to nurse that grudge for days or weeks or even years sometimes. We nurture a grudge uh, so that the slightest offence over time grows into a, some huge drama. We want to feel that hurt. Why? Because we're self-centred, because we're immature, because we're carnally minded, because we're not spiritually mature. We cannot forgive because we don't want to forgive. We choose to be a prisoner of all those debilitating emotions. And it's our choice that we remain a prisoner when Christ has shown us the way that we can be free. The Victorians, that is the people of the Victorian era, not the state of Victoria, of course, they had a concept that they called the deserving poor. And they used that concept to determine who would receive handouts from charities and who would not. The deserving poor were you know, those who hadn't arrived at uh, poverty through any fault of their own and they were the people who they thought the Victorians thought were more uh, likely to use charity to, to better themselves and their circumstances rather than spend it on you know drink and women or whatever so the deserving poor received charity the undeserving poor did not and sometimes we can treat our own brothers and sisters like the Victorian charities treated the poor we try and make value judgments uh, about who deserves our forgiveness um, and who doesn't. Which of our offending brothers or sisters is deserving poor and which are the undeserving poor? Do they deserve to be forgiven? Are they really sorry, we might ask? Will they just do it again if I forgive them so easily? Do they sort of appreciate my mercy and my forbearance that I'm showing to them? Have they really learnt their lesson? Uh, it's really for their own good that I'm, I'm withholding for my forgiveness because they're never going to learn their lesson otherwise. We can't have that attitude. It's not for us to question their motives 
or even the sincerity of their response to our forgiveness. And again, there's great, great danger here, isn't there? We find it hard to forgive a brother seven times because we know, we think we know what his motives are, but we can't judge his motives. We need to remember how hard we find to discern our own motives, let alone the motives of someone else. Now, Matthew chapter 18. I don't think I'm going to have time to go through this, thankfully. <laughs> um, but I do want to mention two things in passing with Matthew chapter 18. So Matthew chapter 18 is the sort of classic chapter about reconciling uh, brothers or sisters who have um, offended against uh, someone in the meeting. Um, now, the first thing you should note is there's some debate about whether the words against thee in verse 15 of, of Matthew uh, chapter 18 are actually in the original. So many manuscripts omit them. So it might be offences generally rather than offences against me personally that Christ is talking about here. That's uh, sort of by the point. But the key thing about this section is that it's not about you know steps that we need to go through to make sure that someone doesn't attend the meeting anymore. It's not about steps we need to go through to disfellowship someone. This section is all about reconciliation. It's not a checklist to tick off with the aim of disfellowshipping someone. So just turn quickly to Matthew 18. I wasn't going to do this, but here we go. I just want to emphasise these few points. Matthew chapter 18 and verse... I'll put this up and then ignore it promptly. So Matthew chapter 18 and verse uh, 15. The key here is at the end of this verse. And this should always be our attitude no matter what sort of process we're going through. And the key here is, if they're, at the end of verse 15, if she, he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So it's all about trying to gain your brother. It's not trying to shove your brother out of the meeting. It's all about trying to gain your brother. And then note again, uh, verse 19, these words, uh, again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on anything, so it's about agreement, it's about getting together as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. So the idea of these two people agreeing together, um, and in verse 20, it sort of talks about the same idea. Uh, it says where two or three are gathered together in my name. It's not really talking about now, we use that verse to say, uh, you know, if we have a meeting with only two or three people in it, then Christ is here in the midst. It's really talking about two or three people getting reconciled together after having a falling out or offending one another. So where two or three are gathered together, where they're reconciled together, in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So the emphasis here is on saving our brother uh, or gaining our brother, as it says. It's on agreeing. It's on agreeing on earth in verse 19 and it's about two or three being reconciled together in verse 20. So this should always be our motivation here. It's not about dividing, it's not about separating the ecclesia, it's about people agreeing, not dividing over a disagreement. So this should always be um, our motivation, this should always be our aim when we uh, sort of wheel out Matthew chapter 18 uh, to um, sort out an issue between brothers and sisters. Christ, as always, is our example. He suffered physical violence, he suffered shame, he suffered abuse, he suffered slander, and finally suffered death at the hands of the Jews and the Romans. Now, of course, Christ had the power to make them feel his pain. He had 12 legions of angels, didn't he, at his disposal. He could more than easily, much more easily than we ever could, make those who were offending against him pay for what they were doing to him. Um, I guess perhaps as a child we might dream of revenge upon you know, those who might, might have picked on us when we were a child. You know, we sort of learn, you know, dream of turning into Superman or learning martial arts and then you know, we'll show them, we think. Um, in fact, the whole superhero idea, um, you know, Superman and, and all those people, the, that industry that began in the 1930s and 40s was largely invented by Jewish cartoonists who were sort of feeling the pain of direct persecution by Nazi Germany or, or communist Russia and they had no power to strike back. Um, so they invented these superheroes like Superman 
who could strike back on their behalf in the, in the pages of comics. So that's exactly where they were coming from. They had no power to strike back, um, but they could only dream of striking back. But of course, Christ did have this power. He had the power at, with a word he could have called on these 12 legions of angels. He could have exacted every inch of pain from his persecutors that they'd inflicted on him. When they taunted him to prove that he was the son of God by coming down from the cross, he could have done exactly that. But what did he do? He suffered himself to be defrauded. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 to 23, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Now we've got a motivation in forgiving, haven't we? If we don't forgive, we know that God's not going to forgive us. But Christ had no such motivation, and yet he still laid down the example for us. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the malefactors, one on his right hand and the other on his left, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. This is true forgiveness, isn't it? They didn't deserve forgiveness. They certainly hadn't repented. They certainly hadn't apologised. Is Christ saying for God uh, to forgive them because he, Christ, couldn't? Well, of course, he wasn't. Was he doing it grudgingly, as we might? Well, he wasn't. Did he wait for the offending party to show evidence of their repentance? He did not. Did he at least insist on the, on the offending party apologising? He didn't do that either, did he? And what motivation did our Lord have here? We've, as I said, we've got the motivation of knowing that if we don't forgive our offenders, then, um, then God's not going to forgive us. Did, did Christ have that motivation? Well, he didn't, did he? He had no sins to be forgiven. Um, we might have thought begrudgingly, well, you know, I better forgive them, otherwise God won't forgive me. But Christ had no such motivation and yet he forgives freely. Here's the ultimate example of agape love in action, love without a cause, forgiving others without a cause. Here is the example for us to follow in forgiving one another.